All right, so, so, all right today we're going to talk about uh, networking protocols. Um, this will be how we're actually going to be able to communicate with the database system. Before we get into that, I want to quickly go over what's, uh, what's on the agenda. Uh, so again, project one is, is due tonight at midnight. Who here is done? It's quite a number of you. Yes, good, excellent, all right. Um, and then project two will be released today. Uh, so I'll talk about that at the end of this lecture here, or various projects. If you haven't signed up yet on the sign-up sheet, please go do that. I know at least three or four of you that are looking for a group. We'll, we'll, we'll put you in a group. Um, and then I'll also post the, uh, the web page tonight with the exact details and deadlines or, or due dates for all the various parts of this project that we'll, we'll talk about today. And then uh, next week we'll give out the, uh, the extra credit, the sign-up for that. Uh, the midterm exam, again, I'm passing around. This is the midterm exam I gave last year. Uh, so the two stacks of papers, one is the actual exam, uh, one's with the exam with the solutions. Um, so you went two sheets for each one and stapled together. And then, again, this, we'll announce this on Piazza, but this will be after spring break. All of you are going to come back in, in class in, in, on March 18th and give a five-minute presentation on, on what you're going to do for the first project, or the, the second project, okay? All right, to the midterm exam. Next Wednesday in this room, 3 p.m., right where you're sitting now. Uh, so it's going to be similar to what I'm passing out now that I did last year, be a mix of multiple choice and short answer. I will say that last year, everyone complained that it was too hard. Um, they weren't wrong. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, and well, part of the reason why, you know, maybe it was considered too hard is like, this is, you know, this is grad graduate school. Like, it's, it's not like, hey, what does this paper say? I, like, I don't care about that shit. Like, I don't care that you can remember or wrote down on your notes what exactly this paper actually did. It's more about the bigger ideas of can you synthesize the things that we've talked about and start to conceptually put them together into a, in, into a system and understand the trade-offs and the various design decisions you have to make when you do these things. So you'll sort of see this in, in the questions I've passed around, right? It's not like, how does this work? Or how, what does this paper say? It's about, like, what, what's the big picture? Because that's, what, that's what's really important. Because you're not going to remember five years from now, if you're off on a job or doing research somewhere, you're not going to remember what the end of these papers said. It's more about the big picture ideas. And that's what I care about. So for this reason, I don't, I'm, it's closed notes because, again, I don't care about what each individual paper says. Um, the final exam will be take home. So that one you can read whatever, whatever you want. But for this, I want to keep it focused on the, just, again, the, the, the big picture stuff. So I've already posted on Piazza what the actual topics will cover. But in terms of the lectures, if you go look at the schedule, it'll be uh, lecture one to lecture 12 inclusive. All right, so I think lecture 12 was, um, uh, like this is 13. Right, so 12 would have been uh, whatever we did, did last class, checkpoints and recovery, right? We're not going to do networking. We're not going to do thread scheduling. Like that's the, this lecture and the next lecture next week. That won't be on the midterm. So it's everything from, from last Monday uh, to the beginning of the semester. OK? Any questions? Again, if you just again, you walked in, we're passing around two packets of paper. Uh, one will have the solutions, and one will have the, the exam questions, the midterm last year. Uh, get you two sheets from each, from each, each packet and staple them together. OK? I think you guys haven't gotten it yet, so we'll, we'll make, sure it, make sure it makes its way over here when you guys are done, OK? All right. So just also now provide an overview of where we're going in the course and what's, what we've done so far and what's ahead of us. Um, this is sort of a, a, a high-level overview of what the, the, sort of the database system we're, 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 we're trying to build in our minds and discussing, what it actually looks like. Um, so we have our application server, and it's going to send us a SQL query that it wants to execute on our system. And the first thing it's going to land in is, is what we're calling the networking layer, right? which is sort of what we'll talk about today, is you know, how do we actually communicate the database server and send it a query. But then this is going to go down the stack and actually go through the planner, um, the compiler, execution engine, and storage manager. So the planner would be like actually parsing the SQL query, looking in the catalog and figuring out how to map uh, the, the name of the table you're accessing to some internal identifier, that's called the binder. It'll be a rewriter phase, which is uh, you know, doing static changes to the query plan or the query itself to make it more efficient. And then there'll be the optimizer with the cost model. Then uh, it goes through this compiler, and this will be sort of unique to the types of database systems we're talking about uh, in this class. This is what modern systems actually do. This is not something we covered at all in, in intro class, and many traditional database systems don't do this. Uh, but the performance benefit is quite significant. 
And again, this will make more sense as we go throughout the later semester. Just know there's a step in here. Then we have the execution engine where we're doing uh, thread scheduling, uh, thread placement or task placement, concurrent control, operator execution, indexing, and then we land down in our storage manager where we have you know, different storage models, different layouts, and you have to do logging and checkpoints. So, so far in the semester, we've covered these topics here. All right? So we know how to build sort of the bottom part. We'll get to thread scheduling on Monday, and then we'll talk about operator execution after the midterm. Right, this will be like how do you do low-level parallel uh, vectorized execution of, of like joins and things like that. But for the rest of the, the, the semester, at a high level, we're going to go in this order. Today, we're going to start about the networking layer. Then we're going to jump back down to the execution engine and then work our way up and talk about the execution engine, the compiler, and then the last classes will be about query optimization. Right? And, and other years, I've done it in the order from, from the top down. Um, for this year, I, I've sort of front-loaded the... Uh, I've added some new, new material that didn't quite fit into this, this hierarchy. Uh, and so that's, that's why it's slightly different. So this is where we're going. Today, we're talking about how to actually take the queries in and run them. Then, starting on Monday next week, and then after the midterm, after spring break, we'll talk about how we actually, actually run the queries. Right? And then we'll, you know, we'll get into compilation parts, which again is, is, is a more efficient way of running stuff. Okay? So th this, this is where we're going. All right, so the, today's agenda is the following. So we're going to spend most of our time talking about networking protocols, uh, you know, what, what they actually look like, or the wire protocols, what do they look like, why do they need them. Um, and then we'll talk about how the operating system is our enemy, and we're trying to avoid it and by using kernel bypass methods. And then we'll finish up talking about how uh, what various topics we can do for project two. Okay. All right. So the essentially the problem we're trying to solve today is how programs can access a database. All right, so this is called the Access API. Um, all the demos that I've given so far uh, in, in this class, when I opened up the terminal, right, all of that were through like you know a command line interface where I would go on my keyboard, type some, some, some SQL queries, hit enter, the, then the, 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 the terminal would then send a, a message to the server, here's the SQL query they want to execute, and then it would execute and come back with the result. So that works for, like again, simple demos, but this is not how we're actually going, going to, can you pass along this way, because these guys need it too, sorry. Yeah. Um, the, this is not how this, the you know the pro, real programmers are actually going to interact with the database because that would be super slow, right? If you're sitting, sitting and scraping the, the terminal and, and parsing the text, like that's no no one would write an application like that. So instead, we're going to look at how we're actually going to do this in real programs using different access APIs. Um, and there's basically three categories, broad categories of how uh, how you can do this. The first will be direct access, which is just like a, a low level API to access uh, the system directly, and this will be uh, vendor specific or database system specific. And then we'll talk about these two different category of, uh, of libraries that are sort of the standard you would use for different applications, right? ODBC and JDBC. So the way to think about uh, the, this first one here, this is like if you've ever done like, um, how do I say this? If you've ever used like a like SQLite in like a C program, like they'll have like their own like low level libraries you link in that allow you to interact directly with SQLite. Or Postgres has another one, I forget, I forget what it's called though. Right? But they, these are again, these are libraries that are very specific to the database system and very specific to like the language you're implementing. Right? The problem is these are, again, as I said, they're database system specific. So like if I write my application using the SQLite library access methods, then if I want to switch over from SQLite to like DB2 or Postgres, it's not going to work because I'm making SQLite calls into SQLite, and it's not, you know, it's, it, you know, DB2 doesn't know anything about it. So that's the problem that these guys are trying to solve. They're trying to provide a standardized in interface that allows me to write programs that interact with databases that can then be, that, that, that is portable across different database systems. So the, uh, the, so probably the most famous one is called ODBC. All right, and this is this, again the standard API that we can use in our program to access the database, and it's designed to be independent of what actually the database system is and what operating system we're running on. So you could have ODBC drivers for you know Windows, Linux, and whatever, um, 
And typically they're written like C or C++, but then you would have language bindings to, to make it work in Python and, and what, whatever, whatever else environment you want to use. So although this wasn't the, the first attempt to actually try to make one of these database connectivity libraries, for whatever reason, this one, this one took off. Like in the, in, the, in the late 1980s, some people out of Sybase started working with, with other vendors and tried to actually make uh, a, you know, a standardized library. I think it was called, it was called DB library. Um, where they took what Sybase did and they ripped out all the Sybase specific calls and they tried to make it generic. That for whatever reason, that didn't take off. And then Microsoft got hooked up with this other company called Simba Technologies. And then they invented the, the standard called ODBC. And then for whatever reason, uh, this is just you know, be became what everyone what follows today. So pretty much if you're going to be a, a database system that you want people to actually use, you have to support ODBC. Right? And it's actually not just specific to uh, relational database systems, a lot of the NoSQL guys that don't support SQL um, will, will, will have an ODBC driver as well. And in the paper you guys read, they were, com they were comparing it against MongoDB, and MongoDB doesn't support SQL, but they have an ODBC library. Because right? it's sort of, again, it's, it's, the idea is that it's hiding away, uh, I mean, it's not, not hiding away the query language, but it's hiding away the, the actual wire protocol implementation to actually communicate with the database. So, um, the basic idea looks like this. So, so the, the ODBC is, is, is called a device driver model. So what that means is that you're going to have this driver, think of it just like a library you link into your, your application that provides a standard API to your application, but then underneath the covers it knows how to take whatever requests that the application makes against that API and convert them to requests uh, that go over the, uh, the network to, to communicate to your, your database server. So in the parlance that, we, or that we're going to care about, we're going to call this part here, the actual construction of the packets and the state machine we have to follow to, to, to process the, the requests of these packets, this is, this is the wire protocol. And this is the part that's going to be specific or, or, or proprietary to pretty much every single database management system. Right? The Oracle, ha Oracle has a wire protocol, DB2 has a wire protocol, MySQL and Postgres, they all have a wire protocol. They don't look really anything alike. At a high level they do, but the actual, with, with the contents of the packets are completely different. So this is the part that is, is vendor specific. And then they will each implement their own ODBC driver. Like you would download uh, you know, the, the Oracle ODBC driver and the Postgres ODBC driver. And they'll again, they'll have the same interface, but underneath the cover, it's them it's them communicating through this proprietary wire protocol with the target database system. So the way you'd actually actually make this work is like because the the, the 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 standard specifies what this data should look like coming out sort of this way into the application, but what the database system is going to send you may not actually match up with that, right? Like for whatever reason, like you know, you could ask for uh, an integer, you assume in the application it's going to be a 32-bit value, but for whatever reason they store everything as 64-bit values. So it's the driver's responsibility, so when it gets that 64-bit value, to convert it into the correct format uh, that, that the application has, expects. And this again, this is, this is defined in the standard. Um, it can do a bunch of other things too, right? Uh, so, you know, there's sort of standard calls like connect to the database, disconnect, send queries, get results, things like that. But it can actually emulate some of the features that the data system actually doesn't have, but is actually required in the standard, all right, in, in the driver itself. So let's say your database system doesn't support cursors. So think of a cursor as uh, just like an iterator. Like I can, I can tell the data system to open, uh, open up a cursor on a query, and then what, what I get back is now a handle to that cursor, and then I can call get next, get next on that handle to get the, you know, each row one by one. Right, by default, if I send the SQL query without a cursor, I get back all the results at once, which may not be what I want. So not every database system will support cursors, so you can emulate that inside, inside here. Right? Because again, everyone has to implement, it has to expose like the, the, the same API. So again, this is what Microsoft came up with. This is what you would use in like the C++ world. If you're in Java, the equivalent is called JDBC, or the, the Java Database Connectivity Library. So this was developed by Microsoft, or sorry, by Sun in the late 1990s, because um, they recognized that they wanted Java to be running in enterprise settings. Enterprise applications want to communicate with databases, so you need a you know, standard database API to do this, right? So 
again, at a high level, it's going to work exactly the same as, uh, as ODBC, like the standard interface that all your Java programs can, can access the database through. But then underneath the covers, they would have whatever vendor-specific wire protocol commands and handling uh, in, embedded in, in the driver. So the, for JDBC, there's actually four different ways to implement this. Right? Again, at a high level, it's the same thing as ODBC, but how it's actually implemented can be slightly different. So the first approach is that you actually don't have a, a way to communicate in Java directly to your database. So you just provide a little bridge that says that, that routes whatever JDBC calls you have in Java to the ODBC driver that's running on your same machine. Right? The next approach is that you have the, the JDBC driver communicate directly with like the C API, the C++ API, to, again, against, against the database system itself. But again, think of like an embedded database. If I want to communicate with SQLite running directly in my system, I could go make calls to its native API and not worry about going over the network. The next approach is to have a middleware system that just takes all the JDBC calls that come out of this middleware, uh, out of the uh, JDBC driver, and then converts them into the, the vendor-specific wire protocol for the da target database system. So the way to think about this is that, like, I have my, my Java applications of wanting one process, and I'll run this middleware and a, a separate another, another process, and the driver just communicates with that middleware through some, some JDBC-specific uh, protocol, and then the middleware then communicates to the data system. So it's sort of like an extra hop along the way because the, the, the driver can't communicate directly to the database system. The last one is probably what, probably is, is, what is the most common one, is, and in, in my opinion, which you actually want, because I think that this will get you the best performance, is you have a implementation of the, of the JDBC uh, the library and the wire protocol of your database system written entirely in Java. You plop down a single jar file that has everything written in Java for you. Right? Um, the reason why I think this is the better, the better one is because this reduces the amount of copying you're doing going from you know, these, between these different levels. Right? This one, you have to be running on the same process. Right? This one has an extra copy or extra hop to get through the middleware, whereas this one can go directly to it. So this first one here is actually not supported anymore. They got rid of it in JDK 1.8. Um, it was a pain in the ass to set up too. I, I, met, I remember trying to set this up for, um, for times 10 from Oracle, and that, that was a nightmare. So again, this is what pretty much everyone do, does, right? Like you'll have a pure Java implementation of your, of your driver. So the, as I said, the, the wire protocol itself is, again, going to be specific to the, the actual database system. Right? It's, it's, they're not universal. The JDBC provides a standard interface, but then what packets they actually send is specific to each database system. So to the best of my knowledge, every single database system will, will communicate over the wire pro protocol through TCP. I'm not aware of any database system that, that uses UDP. And if you think about it, it would be kind of weird, especially if you're doing transactions, because you have no guarantee whether your UDP packet showed up. And so you try to you know, commit a transaction, and you, you, the, the message got lost. Right? So that would be bad. So for that reason, everyone uses TCP. So the standard setup is that uh, the, cl the client starts up and wants to connect to the database system. So it goes through the authentication process, like you know, username, password, and all, the, all that kind of stuff. You may be doing this encrypted or SSL. Um, I, that's pretty, I think it's the default in most systems now. Then you send some query. The, the database system executes that query. Then we serialize the results and put it back into packets that we can then send back to the client, who then knows how to uh, convert them, if necessary, into the form that the Access API expects, right? If, if ODBC expects the, packets, the, the data to look a certain way, so we have to then convert it and transform the data we got back, back from the database system to conform to the, the, the ODBC standard uh, way of rep representing data, right? So what we care about today, what the paper you guys I had you read is this part here, serializing the result, because this is actually going to be the main bottleneck, the main thing that's going to cause performance issues for the type of workloads that, that the paper was, was discussing, like getting, trying to get data out of the system. Right? Because when you think about it, this one's unavoidable. Who cares? Right? It's one back and forth to say, I've, I've authenticated, and we can encrypt that. That's fine. Whether we want to do something fancy with Kerberos, it's not on the critical path for executing queries. So we're going to open up a connection, and it's, going to, and it's going to stay open for a long time. So who cares? Then the client sends us a query, and that's going to be what? A SQL string. Right? In the worst case, in the best case scenario, maybe like a stored procedure or like a prepared statement handle. So that's small too, right? Most SQL queries are a couple kilobytes. 
there's some, I know some, some major uh, companies, they have, they, have, they have queries that are like 10 megabytes, right? <laughs> no, because it's like, it's some dashboard where you can select like, you know, various options. Like here's all the people that live in the state or in the zip code. So you have these, these where clauses with these giant in, in predicates, like is state in, and then you list every state, right? So you can have a lot of this and then it's, and then it's like 10 megs. So, but even then, it's like there's not really any magic we can do to make that work efficiently, other than compress it with like Snappy or or, or Gzip, because it's just a, it's just text, it's just a string, right? So there's no magic there. It's really this part here, right? That's what we want to focus on. That's how we we want to. Uh, that's what the paper you guys read about was to try to make this better. So the <laughs> other thing I'll say too, also, is that. You know, I, I say these are all, all major database systems implement their own proprietary wire protocol. So that's certainly true for every single you know big database vendor that you know about: Oracle, DB2, Microsoft, uh, Postgres, MySQL. All of these guys have their own proprietary uh, uh, wire protocol. In in recent times, in the last ten years or so, we've seen a, there's been a lot of new database systems or database startups where rather than reinventing the wheel and coming up with their own wire protocol from scratch, they actually just reuse the existing ones, right? in particular MySQL and Postgres. Right? So the basic idea is that rather than you having to just make your own wire protocol yourself, your database system, you just go figure out what Postgres and MySQL do, and you speak their wire protocol. Right? I'm, not saying that, I'm not saying those wire protocols are great, and again, the paper you read showed the Postgres one was not good, uh, but it works, and you get all of the client-side ecosystem for those database systems for free if you, if you, if you support their wire protocol. So think about this. I'm, I'm a new database startup. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried about surviving. I want to make money. Do I want to spend my time writing a wire protocol? No. I'll just take what Postgres has. Uh, then I get you know, all their client drivers, their JDBC, OD, ODBC drivers for free. I don't have to implement those them myself. And then it's also a nice selling point for customers. You can say, look, you have Postgres now, drop, you know, get rid of that and plop my thing in, and you don't have to change in your application code. Now, obviously that's not 100% true because if you're, you know, the, the, wire, the wire protocol may be, may be the same, meaning the packets themselves are, look the same, and we know how to interpret those packets and, and ex execute them correctly, but what's actually inside the packets could be different. Because if I don't support Postgres's SQL dialect, then it's, it'll look and smell like Postgres, but it's not actually going to work because it, I'm going to get queries that I can't handle because Postgres could, but I can't. The other thing that'll happen too is that beyond just the SQL dialect, there's a lot of applications, especially the, the administrative applications, when you turn them on and connect to the database, the very first thing they do is go look in the catalog and see what tables do I have. Like if, if you use like some of the visualization tools like MicroStrategy or uh, Tableau, they go, in order then to show you what the list of tables that they have that you can then do visualizations on, they go look in the catalog, like PG tables and Postgres, and say, what tables do I have? So even though, again, you, you support the wire protocol, if they go fishing around in the catalog and don't see things that should be there, uh, then it's gonna, you know, they're going to crap out because it, 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 it's not going to be true Postgres. So it's not enough to, to say you implemented the wire protocol. If you want to be able to say you're a drop-in replacement, for and, and truly compatible with uh, these other open source systems, you got to support all this other crap. And this will also only give you the, the logical or client side uh, stuff. If you have tools that maybe look at the physical files on the database system itself, then like that, those would be completely different in, in your in your separate in your new system than what already exists. So. Uh, as I said, the most common uh, two wire protocols that, that people copy are MySQL and Postgres, which again makes sense because like you know these are probably most, most widely deployed two systems. You know they're, they're not getting the most money. Like Oracle gets the most money, but there's probably more MySQL Postgres installations than Oracle. I can't prove that, but I, it's probably true. No, do not re restart Windows. All right, sorry. Um, so for MySQL. Uh, some, some notable ones are MemSQL, Clusterix, ActorDB, TidyDB, which is out of China, um, Bedrock, I forget who makes this one, and Amazon Aurora. Aurora is special, let me, let me talk about that in a second. But in the case of MemSQL, like when they first announced their startup in like 2009, uh, or maybe 2010, they 
came out of the gate supporting the, the, the MySQL protocol. Now, the way they actually did it was they, they replaced InnoDB with their, their new engine. So they still had the MySQL front end. So that part was still MySQL. Well, when, when they got rid of all of that and wrote everything from scratch, they made sure they kept the, the, the MySQL protocol because, again, that's a good selling point. Be able to say to your customers, you're running MySQL now and you're hitting bottlenecks. Give us money. We'll, we'll plop, you know, we'll lift out MySQL, my plop in MemSQL, and everything still, still just works, right? So I think from, from a business standpoint, that was a good idea. For Postgres, there's a bunch of systems like Redshift, Greenplum, and Vertica. These are actually, again, like they're derived from, from Postgres, so they're forks of Postgres. So of course they kept the, the front end stuff. Um, in the case of Hyper, Cockroach, our old system, Yugabyte, and, these, and Crate, as far as I know, these are fresh or re-implementations of the wire protocol. So we did that in, in our code, and then Cockroach did, did the same thing. So Aurora is a slightly different beast because they were sort of like what I said about MemSQL or you know Vertica and Redshift, where they're actually they were forks of the of the existing systems. Um, I don't know how much of the the code that exists, how, mu how much of the original MySQL and Postgres code in Aurora still exists today. Because they're doing some interesting things like, uh, in the case of MySQL, I know they've, they're pulling out the, the, some of the wire protocol uh, logic out of the actual dis database system itself and they're putting it up into the load balancer layer above the database system. So that's pretty wild. But again, like again, like from the outside, it'll look and smell like, like, uh, like real MySQL and real Postgres, which again is an, is an amazing selling point. For Spark SQL, as they talked about in the paper, uh, they support the Hive wire protocol. And as far as I know, no, nobody else does. I couldn't find anything else. Um, Splice Machine supports uh, Apache Derby, like supports their, their JDBC drivers. So a, a bunch of different systems do different things. And it's usually whatever, whatever they're based on, unless they implement the wire protocol from scratch, they'll just reuse the, their JDBC libraries. All right. So now we want to talk about how we actually want to uh, design our protocol. So the paper I had you guys read was out of uh, the, the MonetDB group at CWI in, in Europe, in the Netherlands. So MonetDB was uh, one of the major academic column store database systems that actually sort of went beyond the walls of the university and actually is used in production in a bunch of places. Right? And it's an older one too. It's from, from around the same time as Vertica, so like mid-2000s. Mid um, and they're still working on it today. So for this one, we want to talk about how we're actually going to serialize the data or the result of a query and put it into packets, and then we send that over our wire protocol. As I said, we don't care about the queries coming in. It's really how we're getting the data out. And we're going to focus on how we're doing uh, you know, bulk data export or, or large result sets. Right? If it's OLTP, we're not reading that many uh, you know, each query is only going to return a small number of tuples, small number of results. So, so there's, we care but not care that much. It's when we really want to start exporting large data sets that these things become, become an issue. I mean, we want to look at alternatives. So we'll talk about how to do row versus column layout, compression, serialization, and then how to handle strings. And then I'll, I'll show some, some benchmarks that they provide. So again, the one thing to think about also too is like whatever optimization we talk about here today, we have to implement it in our database server, but we also have to be able to implement it in our client driver. So whatever crazy compression scheme we come up with in the server, it has to be able to support that on, on the client side as well, because it has to un, you know, uncompress or decompress whatever you send it. So I think a lot of the times the, the, the client drivers are, are quite conservative, and because you don't know whether you're running on you know, a big machine or you're running on like a cell phone. So, you, so typically, traditionally, JDBC and ODBC drivers try to be quite lightweight, whereas in some of these schemes, uh, you know, they're, if you do more heavy compression, then you have to decompress it on the other side, and that may not be good for, for your environment. But again, they're focusing on large data exports, so you're not going to you know, download one terabyte of data on your cell phone right? through, through, through SQL. Right? That'd be stupid. All right, so the first one is, is row versus column. So ODBC and JDBC by their very nature of how the, these, these APIs are defined, are row-oriented, right? Like you open up a, a, a connection to the database, 
you run a query and then you get a cursor back or you get an iterator back and you have a while loop that calls fetch, fetch, fetch next row. And that's going to get you one row at a time through that call. And this is partly because they were designed from, from a time when in the 1990s you, we weren't doing machine learning and other things. We were doing business applications or pretty simple uh, data analysis where you know, we're going to go get, you know, run a transaction and go get one tuple at a time or go get a small number of tuples at a time. So this API totally made sense from, for, for that class of workloads, which is an important class of workloads and it's very common, but for data export, it, it's not going to be ideal. So all of this, the same storage uh, model optimizations we talked about last time for rows versus columns totally still makes sense here. Right? For analytical queries, we want to try to process um, you know, vectors of columns as much as possible because that'll, that'll uh, you know, one, that's what these, 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 these modern data science applications actually want, like TensorFlow, uh, Spark, and um, like PyTorch, and like this machine learning stuff. They want things to be in vectors and matrices and columns. Right? And if we had to transform it into rows, then that's going to be expensive. So, if we sort of target what we think the application is going to do with it correctly, then that would tell us we probably want to be in a column. But then also, too, when we do compression and, and, and other methods of storing things more efficiently in packets, having all the, uh, the values within some sort of stride of memory in the packet, like have them all be part of the same domain, means I can get better compression because I can do RLE or delta encoding, all the stuff that we talked about before. So many techniques for compression, which we'll see in the next slide, can still be applied here if we organize things in columns. Because again, that's going to be better for what the, uh, what the application is going to want. So the way they recommend you actually do this is that instead of storing in your packets, send and sending back uh, you know, within one packet only data for a single column, which you would have in a, in a true column store, what they recommend is that within one batch or one packet, you send back a batch of rows, but then, then organize them in a column-oriented fashion. That's essentially how we implement storage in, in the current system now, the new system. Uh, this is called the PAX model. So every block will have uh, a, every block has the tuples, or right? so every block has all the data for a single tuple. But the way we've, we've laid out the data for that tuple is in a column-oriented fashion. So we're not doing it, you know, continuous memory for all the attributes. It's for, for a single attribute for across all tuples, we store them contiguously. So that's what they recommend to do here to get better performance uh, for these data analysis platforms. So once we do that, now we can also do compression. And again, this is the same thing we talked about for, for, for storage. We can either do naive compression, like gzip or snappy, whatever, whatever your favorite compression algorithm is, Z standard. Or we can do this in a sort of columnar specific uh, encoding where we take the advantage of the fact we're storing things as vectors. They're all going to be in the same domain, and then we can do RLE and, and delta encoding or dictionary encoding. So they end up arguing in the paper that naive compression is actually the, 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 the better approach for sending network packets, uh, which is different than what we talked about with, with storage, you know, in the database storage. And that's because it's agnostic to the layout of the actual data. So you don't need to do, you know, in the, the networking layer, as you're constructing these packets to send them back to the database server, you know, or sorry, to the client, you don't have to look at the schema and figure out, like, all right, my data is this type, and it has, you know, this length, and I have this many values, and, and therefore, what's the, you know, what's on the fly, figure out what the best compression scheme is. You just serialize all your data within the packet, run gzip or snappy on it, and then you're done, right? It's super easy. So they argue from a sort of software engineering standpoint, it's just easier to do naive compression because you don't have to implement this, all this extra stuff. And then furthermore, as I said before, whatever, you know, if we use columnar compression, we have to implement that on the client side too, right? And then that, you know, that means we're basically implementing this logic in two locations, actually in three locations if you want to do ODBC plus JDBC. Uh, so you just do naive compression. On the client side, there'll be libraries you can use to decompress things, and then you're done. So I, I think I, I agree with that. The other thing they point out too is that, and this is sort of obvious, is that the, the slower your network is between the, the server and the client, then the more heavyweight compression scheme you want to use. Because if you're bottlenecked on bandwidth, then you're willing to pay the CPU cost to be more, use a more aggressive compression scheme that will give you a, a better reduction in the amount of data that you're storing. right? 
So again, that's that's no brainer. I mean, that's that's sort of uh, that's a standard trade off that we talked about before. All right. The next issue is that how we're actually going to uh, represent the data we want to send back in our packets. So the two approaches to do this are either binary or text encoding. So the binary encoding is just in the same way that we, we would organize or lay out the data inside of our database. I said that we had these the, the primitives would be stored in the way that C++ stores them. And then if we have floats, we could use the fixed point or the floating point numbers. right? All that is, 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 is the same thing we want to do here. Right? Represent the data in, in, its, in a binary form. Now, the thing we got to be, be careful about now is because now, you know, now we're sending data outside of our system to some other machine or some other client. We need to be mindful about the endianness of our data uh, and make sure that the client and server are in sync. Because right? it would be bad if I send over packets and the server and the server is big endian and I land on the client and the client's little endian and it, and, and it can't handle it correctly. So whether you do this, uh, you know, I, I think you can always do this in the client. I think that that's, you could do it in either one, the server or the client, but it's better to do it in the client because then you don't have to worry about what it actually is. So you, you, the wire protocol specifies what the NDNS will be, and the client know, needs to know that I'm on this, I'm on this machine, uh, and my NDNS is different than what I got, so I make sure I flip things around, right? But in, in actuality, this is not really a big deal because most machines are x86, right? Yes, your phone will be ARM, or there might be some power machines. So in that case, you have to handle that. But in practice, it's probably not that common. So the other thing I'll say too is that the the closer to the, the, the internal binary format that the database uses to represent data, the closer that is to what your wire protocol expects, then the less work you have to do to take the result of a query and put into packets. So we had this problem in the old Peloton system because the how Peloton would represent data in the actual database itself was different than what Postgres expected on its wire protocol because we implemented the Postgres wire protocol. So we'd have to basically copy some of the, the, the data like two or three times, at least two times, uh, probably three times, so that was a mistake. But we had to copy at least twice to transform it into the format that Postgres expected, right? Because Postgres was, was, was representing data in the, you know, in the real Postgres system completely different than how we were doing it. So if you can match what the wire protocol is going to use and with what you use in, on the actual internal, in the internal database, then it's, it's, it's much more quick. It's, there's less overhead to actually generate the packets. Now, again, if you're copying the MySQL Postgres wire protocol, it's unavoidable. The other alternative, like so, you know, in, you, know you could convert it to the binary format that, that's specific to your system or the, your wire protocol. Another alternative is actually rely on some of these existing serialization formats that, that exist for sort of general purpose distributed systems, you just reuse those inside of our database system and store the data in packets that way. So if you ever heard of Google protocol buffers or thrift, these are like serialization libraries. I define a schema for what a, what a, what a message would look like. Here's a bunch of primitives. Here's some maybe ne some nested structure. And then uh, they have a compiler that would then generate C, C code or Java code, whatever language you're trying to write in they will generate you code that allows you to construct these messages and then serialize them into a like, compressed binary form. So in the case of Hive, uh, in the paper you guys read, the Hive protocol, they use Thrift. Um, in practice, I don't know of any other major database system that actually uses either the, one of these two things because there's a bunch of extra stuff that they do and, and that they store in, in the messages themselves, or the, the actual data, that we don't actually want in our database system because we already know what the schema is going to be because, you know, for our database, we have that. Um, and there's other, like, extra stuff, like, like they do extra copies to get the data into the byte buffers that they expect that we don't want to do. So in case of, like, protocol buffers, in addition to actually the, the data we're, we would send over, they also include some schema version information to keep track of, like, what version of the message structure is this. Because they're worried about running, again, not in database systems, but like in, in sort of disparate distributed systems. All right, the other approach, is the alternative to binary encoding is to do text encoding. And this is like the simplest thing to do. You take whatever you're storing, uh, whatever, whatever your data you want to send over, and you convert it to a string. And then on the client side, they just know how to do the reverse. They take the, uh, the string that you sent them and then put it back into its correct uh, primitive form. Right, so if you wanted to convert like integers to strings in C, it's just A to I. 
All right, so the command will look sort of like this. So say I want to I want to send over a 32-bit integer, four bytes, the value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I would convert that literally to just the string with the characters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I send it over the network, right? And then on the client side, it knows how to do conversion into the binary form that it expects to hand off to then the like the, the JDBC, ODBC layer. So what's nice about this is you don't have to worry about any of the Indianist stuff because the client will just take care of that for you, right? Um, the downside though is you end up storing more data than you would you would otherwise in the binary form. So again, this is a 32-bit integer here, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's we can represent that as exactly four bytes. If I send the string over, then there's six characters in the string, so that's at least six bytes right there. But then I also need to store either what's the length of the string or a, uh, a null terminator character to say when the string stops. And that's going to be more than, uh, you know, that's going to be some more extra bits or bytes. So this would be at least, you know, at least six bytes, but probably more. So what I could have represented as four bytes, I now represent as six or seven bytes. So that may not be a good trade off. So is this clear? All right. Uh, the, the last thing to talk about is how do you handle strings. So there's the three approaches to do this. And this is sort of the, again, the same stuff we talked about with variable length storage uh, in, in databases in general, right? So you can have, for a variable length string, you can, you can denote where it ends, just with a, the null terminator uh, character. Um, so now on, on the client side, as I'm parsing my packet, and I, have, I see I have a string field, to figure out where it ends, I have to keep scanning until I find the null terminator. The alternator, the alternative is to just prefix the string with the length of the string in the front of it, um, which is what we do in our internal system for for varlan. So that again allows you to figure out where where a field stops and it stops and stop, starts and stops. And the last approach is to do fixed length, fixed width uh, strings, where you just take whatever the max size of the string, which you know because we have a schema, we know what the attribute uh, looks like. And then we just pad out the, the, the trailing characters with spaces for, you know, to make it sure it fits exactly what the max size is, right? So the, the paper talks about that in, in different workloads, in different scenarios. Sometimes this one's faster, sometimes this one's faster. Uh, there's no one that's better than another, and different databases will do different things. But nobody's going to do both. Like, no one's going to spend the time to actually alternate between these two based on what, you know, what few bytes or, or, or bits they can save uh, for, your, for your, you know, your packets. They just pick one and, and live with it, right? Um, the, the last one was fastest in, I think, their experiments when the max size of this thing was really small. Like if it was like one character, then, then this is going to beat anything else, right? Um, but depending on, that's not always that common. All right, um, so the last thing I'll also point out too is for all these four different design decisions we have to consider, they're not independent. Um, and in particular, the easiest one to reason about is compression. So depending on what, you know, how I represent my strings, that may determine whether one compression scheme is better than another. So, and it depends on what the actual data looks like you want to store. So if I'm using the fixed width, fixed width strings, and my string size, max string size is 128 characters, but most of my characters, most of my strings are two characters, then I'm gonna have all these empty spaces after that. That's gonna be amazing for you know, standard snappy compression, right? Because it can be able to, to trim out or, or reduce that, all those, uh, those space, space characters. Um, so that might make fixed width work really, really well, but in other scenarios, it might, you know, this it might, it might perform poorly, and this one actually might be better. So the main takeaway about this is that these aren't independent. Uh, there's different trade-offs for each of them, and there's I don't think there, there's I don't think it's possible to say that there's one there's one implementation that that is better than all all of them. All right. So real quickly, let's look at some benchmarks. So this is uh, provided to us by the author uh, Hans at CWI. So for this, we're, I'm going to show two results. We we'll show one result where we only transfer one tuple. And then another result where we transfer uh, uh, a million tuples. So for this, they're going to use the line item table from the TPCH benchmark. Um, and they're going to use JDBC for, uh, sorry, ODBC for all these systems except for Hive. They're going to use, uh, they're gonna use uh, JDBC. 
So it's, it's quite an awesome mix of systems that they have, right? Because they have MoninaBDB, which is what they work on. Then they have MySQL using compression and no compression, Postgres, and then commercial guys, Oracle, Mongo, and, and DB2. And then Hive, again, is representing the sort of JDBC thing. So across the board, what you see is that the MySQL actually performs the best here. Right? To go grab one tuple, it does quite well. Even with compression, it does better than everyone else. And I forget, forget exactly why they, um, they, they claimed this was the, they performed better. Um, I think it, just, it wasn't so much, how, I think it was sort of the, the networking stack itself, how they get, you're able to get data in and out of the system, like, and, and not how, you know, what, what the actual packets look like. Um, the other surprising thing was, I mean, so, so for Hive here, I don't know whether it's slow because it's Java or because there's some issues with HDFS, Right, or just the protocol itself is super slow, but it actually surprised me how bad DB2 was. Right, because this is a commercial system. Right, they have they have money, uh, they they could fix these things. So to avoid the overhead of of or sort of to, to narrow the scope of, of the, the measurements to just to be about getting data out and serializing it, for this the way they set it up was they would run the query multiple times on the on the server so that the system would cache the query plan and cache, in some cases, the actual result. So it's not like we're measuring things like going through the, the SQL parsing layer and then actually you know, running through the optimizer or generate query plan. All that's cached ahead of time. So it's really how fast we can get data in and out. All right, so all right, and the other thing to point out, too, is also uh, MoneyDB here is using text encoding, but all these other guys are using binary coding. So again, you would think this thing would be terrible, uh, because it seems like a really dumb thing to do, but in, in practice for them, it actually it works quite well. Um, and again, these guys are doing binary coding, but they're the worst. All right, so now let's look at the same, same setup of the experiment, but now instead of uh, grabbing one tuple, we're going to grab a million tuples, and then we're going to scale along the x-axis here, the, the network latency. So they're going to purposely make the, the network slower and see how that affects the, the performance of the system and how long it takes to get data out. So I'm going to show MoneyDB. Oh, I, I want to focus on, on the MySQL with compression. There's no way to get PowerPoint to show. I guess I could reorder them up there, but there was no way to show MySQL first without having to show this other line. So you can ignore the black line. It's going to look the same trend is going to look like everyone else. The thing I want to point out here in the case of MySQL is that with compression, compression ends up being the, the main bottleneck because they're using gzip, which is a slow compression scheme. Um, so the CPU overhead is essentially the, 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 the main issue here. Right? That's, why, that's why it's sort of. It's sort of fixed, no matter how slow the network gets. Um, I mean, it's getting a little bit slower, but not that, not by that much. Um, and again, because the size of the data you're actually compressing and sending over is the same, so it's the same CPU cost for all of these, and that's the penalty you're paying. Now, everyone else is going to get slower because they're not doing compression as the, the as the network gets slower. The interesting thing to point out here is DB2 ends up being the worst, uh, and Oracle is actually the second best here. Um, when the network's really fast, but it ends up being the second worst here when the network's really slow. Um, I forget why they, they, they said this was the case. Um, I don't know if I remember that. Yeah, so I, that, that was one finding I, I don't have an answer to. So what can we take away from this? There's no one protocol is better than another. Uh, compression you probably want to use uh, selectively based on what the, the data is going to return. Um, Again, doing this would be pretty simple. Like the packet you say whether something's compressed or not. And you can decide whether you're shipping over a lot of data, whether you want to compress it ahead of time. But maybe you probably don't want to use gzip. Something more lightweight like snappy or zstandard would be the, the better way to go. All right, so any questions about wire protocol design? Again, this is focused on transferring a lot of data. If, if it's a single packet or single, single, single tuple, we should go find out whatever MySQL does, and we should do the same thing. right? Okay. All right. So, so for all of these, all of these, um, these examples here, the as I said, they're they're communicating with the client over TCP. And so the way you do that is going through the operating system. So they're all going to pay the same penalty to you know, no matter what kind of how they form their packets whether they're using compression or not, all that's up in user space. At the end of the day, we need to put packets into buffers and then send that over the network and going through TCP, which means we have to go through the OS. 
right? The problem is though, the the OS, as I said, is 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 slow. I mean, I should be careful about this. The TCP stack it's slow, right? Because the way it works is that the you 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 if you know to get messages in and out, they're going to do this through context switches, which are expensive. Right? You're going to have an interrupt to say, hey, your packet's here. You're 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 sending a packet. And they're doing that through interrupts, which now means that we fall down to the kernel. The kernel takes its own latches to, to protect its data structures. And again, we're doing context switches, and that's that's not cheap. The other issue we're gonna have too is like in order to send a message, the, the OS wants to maintain its own memory because it because when I hand it a packet to send it over the network, it doesn't want, you know, when I go back up into my, my program, it doesn't want me to now, you know, mess around with that that memory, maybe deallocate it before it gets to actually on the hardware device and send it out over the network. So the OS is going to maintain its own buffers for the Ethernet cards or the NICs. That, that means it has to copy whatever data you send it into those buffers before it can send it. So that's actually a bunch of extra, extra copying that we don't have to do, that we, we want to try to avoid. And of course, as I said already, they already take, the OS is, 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 you know, the OS is maintaining its own latches for its own data structures, and we can get bottlenecked on that if we have other uh, uh, contending threads coming in and doing it. So, since the OS is our frenemy, we want to try to avoid it, right? It's like my parents, they would have a I'm trying to avoid them. Um, so, uh, oh, all right, so to avoid the operating system, we can use a technique called kernel bypass. And the basic idea here is that we're the, our program, our database systems process is going to allow to interact with the hardware directly to send messages over the network and receive messages, but without having to tell the operating system about it, without having to do any copying on it. So we're literally going to have memory buffers that we can share with the actual the hardware device itself. And we can, we can get data into that and we can put data, you know, get data out of it and put data into it to send over the network. So the advantages should be obvious, right? We're doing less copying. We're not going through the OS for any of this. We're going to get much better performance. So the two ways to do this are to use uh, the D DPDK, the D Data Plane Development Kit, or to do remote direct memory access. So I didn't know really how to, how to categorize these, uh, but I'll say like the, the DPDK is actual, it's an actual thing. It's a library you can use called the DPDK. Remote direct memory access is more of a technique or a method, and there's libraries that provide RDMA for you. Right? Just, but the, the, at a high level, they're doing different things, but just be mindful. Like this is the thing you can download. This is the thing you like. You 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 download something else that implements this or, or provides this. All right. So the DPDK was originally a uh, uh, a library provided or written by Intel that allowed you to access your program or, or database system running in user space. It allows it to access the NIC hardware directly. And the 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 basic idea is this: like you you. It exposes through, through this, this library buffers that are on the NIC, and you can you can fill them in with, with, with packets you want to send, and then you pass them along to the to the hardware itself. And then there's a mechanism to get notified when when things show up that you want to read that that belong to your process, right? So this is not a magic library. You just download it and link it into your application. You actually have to go rewrite your application to use their uh, to use the DBKDA calls. To send messages and receive messages instead of making the syscalls to you know Berkeley sockets or the or the operating system, right? So you have to refactor your code in order to take advantage of this, right? So like think of this as like a standard programming library for accessing bare metal hardware on on the NIC. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff the OS maybe would do for you to help you. You have to do that yourself, right? So the there's not many very systems that actually use this. The only one that I'm aware of is called ScaliaDB. Uh, ScaliaDB is a is a re-implementation of Cassandra in C++. So Cassandra is in Java. Um, in in they basically rewrote everything, like the wire protocol, but actually the the actual storage system itself and the execution engine. All that's been rewritten in C++. And one of the ways they get better performance is that they have this library based on the DPDK called CSTAR that supports this kernel bypass method. And they built that library, and then on top of that, they built ScaliaDB. They also have a version of memcache that, that runs on CSTAR. Um, but ScaliaDB is, is their, their, their main product here. 
So the this sounds amazing, but as I said, it, it's it's not trivial to write unless you're using like a, 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 you know already written library like C star. Um, I also don't know how portable it actually is. Originally, it was only for Intel NICs, right? Because again, they were trying to make their hard, sell their hardware. Um, Intel then handed off development to the Linux Foundation, so now they own it. Um, I don't know how many other vendors actually support it. I don't know. We could just Google this. I don't know whether you you, you can run this on EC2, right? Like you do have to buy you do have to buy NICs that actually have this 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 capability. So it's not like it's universal. Like your laptop's not going to be able to do this. Um, to give you an idea again, how bad this actually, how difficult this, this can actually be, um, I got this great tweet a few years ago from somebody, uh, and he's talking about the SPDK, which is the storage plane data kit. It's like the it's like the DBDK, but actually communicating with disk drives. Same idea, it's doing kernel bypass. And he basically says these kernel bypass methods are great. It's like peeing your peeing your own pants to keep yourself warm. It's a good idea at the beginning, but then you regret it later on. Right. <laughs> So I think that's a really apt metaphor for this. Um, the other kernel bypass method is called remote, di remote, di remote direct memory access, or RDMA. And the, the way to think about this is that it, it, it'll be this library that you can, you can get that allows you to make, uh, to reference memory locations stored on other machines. And you, it's, like, it's almost like you're reading memory that's local to you. You do an access or a load in that memory, then underneath the covers, the hardware can intercept that, recognize that the, the data you're, you're trying to access is on another machine, go down through the NIC, go over the network, get the data you want, and do your, do your reads and writes. So for this one, I don't know how much of your application you have to change. I think there's some stuff you have to be aware of, because you have to figure out, you have to know what the memory address you want to read on the other machine is, and then, you have to, then uh, that server has to be, be able to allow remote you know, remote programs in order to access it. So it's not like it just again, you don't just link it in and magically happens. The other tricky thing about this is that the 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 server that you're reading from over or, or, or RDMA, it doesn't know you're doing anything. It doesn't know you're reading and writing. So there's no callback mechanism to say I read something. So I just got read by somebody else. So there's extra there's some extra work you have to do to to know when someone has read something that you wanted them to read or whether they wrote something. Right. That's there's more stuff you have to do other than just linking in or having, extending your address space with remote memory. So the most famous uh, system that uses uh, RDMA, again, you have to buy expensive, these, so this one you have to buy specialized hardware that supports RDMA. Uh, like I think the commercial version is called Affiniband. Have you ever heard of that? Mellanox sells them. They're very expensive. I think you can do, Ether, uh, you can do RDMA over Ethernet. I don't know how widely uh, supported that is. But Oracle Rack is probably the most famous one in Exadata. They rely on expensive... Infiniband drives to do remote direct uh, RDMA to other machines and, and, and data stores. Microsoft has this interesting um, research system. I don't think I don't know if, it, if it's actually in production called Farm. Um, and this is pretty crazy. Like they like in order to get RDMA to work in a transactional environment, they have to do like four phase commit because again, you don't know you don't know when somebody reads and writes data. So there's a bunch of extra steps you have to do to figure out you know when you're allowed to commit your transaction. So. Again, the main takeaway from these is that the OS is, is going to be in the way. So even if, no matter how op optimized we make our wire protocol, if we're still going through the OS, then it's you know it's not going to be as performant or efficient as we would want. Okay. All right. So I rushed this very quickly because uh, I want to get to the, the second project. But again, it's everything I already said. So the the networking protocol is an important aspect of a database system. We're trying to implement Postgres here. Um, and for OLTP, it's fine. For, for OLAP queries, it may be problematic. Um, and then kernel bypass makes things, uh, can, can, can improve efficiency. Um, but it's, it's, you probably wouldn't see kernel bypass methods actually for the, 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 the wire protocol stuff. You'd primarily see it for the internal messaging between, like, if you're, if you're a distributed database. But there's no reason you couldn't do it for our wire protocol. OK? All right, project two. So as I said before, in the beginning of the semester, this is a group project. And the idea is that this is a large portion of your final grade for the course. Right? There's a reason why this counts as a, as a system elective. Um, so the expectation is that everyone's going to implement a, a, a large piece or a large component or feature in the database system that we're building here at Carnegie Mellon. 
So the projects that you can you can target could be the things I'm going to present today, things we're going to going to going to focus on in the course, or if there's some alternative thing that you really want to build because it's related to your own research or whatever you're doing in another class, then I'm I'm I'm, I'm game for that. But you obviously have to get approval from me first, right? The other important thing is that every group has to do something unique. So you can't have two groups doing the same project because that'd be stupid. Uh, so everyone has to pick something that uh, that is different from everyone else, and because uh, you know, it, it, it end up being first come first serve. So if you really want to do something and you're dying to do something, make sure your your group agrees to it and you should sign up for it uh, right away. Okay. All right. So what do you have to do for the project? What, what are the deliverables? So I'm going to go through each of these one by one. But basically, you start off with getting a proposal to the class to say what you're going to do. Then you'll have a status update and say, well, we actually started implementing this. Here's what we found out. Here's some issues we had. And then a design document des describes what your overall imp implementation is going to be. And then we're actually going to do two, two rounds of code reviews. Uh, we're actually going to do peer review of the code from other people. And they'll, they'll, they'll review yours. And that way, you know, you, you, you're not doing stupid things. And you get to see what other people's code looks like. Then we'll do the final presentation. And then we'll have the, the, the code drop to get your final grade. OK, so I'll go through each of these. All right, so the first Monday after spring break, everyone's going to come up on here and with your group and give a five minute presentation that describes what you plan on doing. So this, we won't record this, so don't feel like you're, you're gonna be embarrassed, I don't care, right? And so for your proposal, you're gonna talk about not just say, hey, here's a high level thing we wanna do. You actually wanna describe, here's the files we think we're gonna have to modify or here's what we're gonna have to end up building because it doesn't exist now in order to implement our project. So this is forcing you to actually think through like, oh is this a good idea or not? Like, am I, am I going down a rabbit hole that I, it's just not gonna work out, right? Like one year, one group wanted to say, but they wanted to implement views. And I was like, like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And it's clearly they had not thought about this at all, right? Uh, and had they chosen that project, they would have you know, never finished. So part of this is, again, forcing you to figure out what it is actually going to need to be able to do to implement your project. And then we can scope out whether that's actually feasible um, from now until the end of the semester. This is slightly less important because we don't support SQL in our system now, which I'll talk about in a second. But Part of the reason why I had you guys write down when and you do the reading review is what workloads they're using because that at least sort of think about like for what you're building, what workload are you targeting, and therefore what what kind of benchmark you should be running, what test cases you should be running. All right, so you at least be able to think about that. So then we do a status update, and that'll be uh, I think the first week of April or so, and that's where you can come back up here in front of the class and give another presentation about what you guys have implemented so far. And again, the, 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 for the proposal, you definitely should look at the code, maybe start writing some, some of it. But at this point here, you should be far enough along that you can talk reasonably about how things are going. Um, you can also talk about, you know, it's OK if it turns out like what you end up doing is it was too complicated and we have to switch to something else. But you need to be able to explain to the class why you made that change. Also, what the purpose of you guys coming in front of everyone else and talking about it, instead of just coming and talking to me, is like what will happen is, There'll be certain features that, that one group needs, and then maybe they build, but then it turns out another group need, needs the same thing, and you guys can then share code. So we certainly had groups do this before, where they were sending pull requests to each other and, and, and swapping codes and tests and things like that, which is actually pretty cool. Um, and then again, anything that surprised you during the process. So now, what we are doing new this year as well is that we're requiring you to write a design document that lays out, you know, not in code examples, but actually in English, what it is that you're actually building and why are you building in that way and what are the, what are the ramifications or implications of, of your design. So we'll have a template available for you. It's a markdown file that have all these different sections that describe what's expected for each of these, right? So basically, again, how you're going to build it, why you're building it, how you're going to test it, what are some issues you could foresee with your implementation, and then if someone to come behind you and continue you know, your project, what could they work on, OK? And that has to be due the same day as the, the status update. Because by then, you, you've, you've worked on the project long enough, you, you can talk intelligently about it. Then we're doing the code reviews. Again, so this will happen twice in the semester. It'll be one around the status update, and then one the week before the final due date. Uh, we'll pair each other up. We'll just use GitHub. So they'll submit a pull request on to the, the, master, uh, the, the main repository on GitHub. Then the other group would then do a review, and they can comment on it and, and provide feedback about you know, what changes you made. So to make the other group's job easier, you, it's not just you throw the code up and say, hey, look at it. You actually provide, in the write-up, 
hey, here's the files we modified, here's the things we, we want you to look at, and here's how it actually works. Right? So for this, the grading for this part will be based on participation, because I want everyone to participate in all the code reviews. So I don't want it to be like, well, you know, one person does the first review and then, the, then, then the, the second person does the other review. Everyone has to participate equally in both steps, right? Because then seeing the same code multiple times in the, in the two code reviews, you'll have a better understanding of what they're doing and therefore you have, you'll make better comments and get better feedback, okay? So I can't stress this enough. This is like super important, like when you go out in the real world. Like, like in, in classes, you write a bunch of code and then the semester's over and you walk away. Right? At your job, you're not going to write a bunch of code and then throw it over the fence and assume someone else is going to take it, right? You're going to have to do code reviews. You're going to have to have people review your code and get feedback. And then you end up actually learning a lot too because you learn other tricks about writing C++ and other techniques that you may have not encountered and like things that we're, you know, we're not going to teach you in a class, right? I learn things all the time when I, when I do code reviews, so, that, so it's fun. Um, so I'll do a... Uh, I'll do a lecture or sort of a mini mini lecture once uh, one class and you know how to actually do a good code review, um, what, what's expected. All right, final presentation. It'll be whenever the uh, our, our final exam date is. Do we have a date yet or no? What date? Tuesday. Is that is it? Like, is it what time? One year. Last year they gave us eight thirty, which is retarded. Eight thirty in the morning. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Also, it's Monday. Monday, May 6th. It's Monday, May 6th? 8.30 to 11.30 in the morning. All right. <laughs> all right. So normally we get pizza. We'll get bagels, all right, or, or donuts, whatever. All right. Um, we'll do it in this room, too, because like they put us in a big room, and I told them not to. Um, whatever. All right. Um, all right. So you do a final presentation. Basically, like here's everything you did. Like Giving a demos are awesome. Showing like benchmarks are awesome, right? Not just like presenting it, actually showing the thing actually runs would be really cool. Like one year kids were giving demos of like SQL extensions and stuff like that. So I highly encourage you for, for both the final final presentation and the status update, give demos, right? All right, so this is just sort of is a, is, is a sort of saying what, what we've done. You don't actually get a final grade though until your, your code, your, you submit a pull request on GitHub that can cleanly merge into the master branch pass all the tests and verifications, uh, and provides the documentation, like an updated design document to, that describes what you actually did, right? So the goal for this is to merge your code into the master branch, right? Again, you want this code to live beyond you know, this class. Uh, whether you're gonna you know, hang out in the summer with us doing research or come back in the fall and do like a capstone project if you're a master student, like we're gonna continue, we're gonna continue working on this thing. So you want your code to be you know, as, uh, as useful as possible, right, to others. So now I realize if we start merging, then that's going to cause uh, collisions with your pull request. So what we've done in the past, we just do this, we do, do a random order, or we, or we decide which things we actually want to merge now, maybe merge later. So the, the goal should be that your code can merge cleanly. Um, but, but if we end up with collisions after you submit your PR, then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be... Um, I'll be mindful of that, okay? All right, so we'll give you another 50 bucks on Amazon uh, AWS credits. When you submit your PR to our repository on GitHub, that automatically triggers builds on Travis and uh, Jenkins build cluster that we have here at CMU. Um, and those machines are, are much nicer than the Travis machines. If you think you need special hardware, which this year I don't think anybody should, um, but like one year somebody wanted some fancy SSDs, so we got some from them. If you need special hardware, let me know. All right, again, don't, don't run out of money on Amazon, okay? All right, so now I want to talk about the projects, but I want to have a huge disclaimer. So in the previous years, it was all based on Peloton, and, and as I said, we threw away the code because it was a train wreck, and, but we're not at the state we were in previous years where we have a full functioning database system that you can open up the terminal and start sending queries to, right? It's a work in progress, um, and we're actively working on it now. Like we have a full-time engineer on the 9th floor helping us build this thing, and a bunch of you guys in the class are helping us build this thing. So these projects are going to be very narrow and focused, and they're going to be at the sort of the lower level parts of the system. If you look at the previous years, what people have done, it's like adding SQL functions or sequences or temp tables. All that is sort of in the upper levels of the system. We just don't have that yet. So that's why for the first project I had you guys do like a low level perf analysis, because that's what you're going to have to deal with to implement one of these projects. Okay? 
So again, we're, we're, don't think of this as, as, as an adversarial thing, like you're not competing against each other. We're all sort of working together. If there's some feature that somebody needs uh, and, and it doesn't exist, but another team can, is gonna build it because they need it, we should be sharing that code. And that's why I wanna sort of, everyone should be talking to each other as, as we go along. Or if there's something you need and it doesn't exist and uh, you don't, don't know how to build it, I could get you know one of the team members to build it, potentially, okay? All right, so project topics. There's eight groups, and I'm proposing here uh, five or 10 projects, uh, but I'm open for suggestions if you have other things you're really interested in working on. So query optimization, uh, I'll, I'll just, we're short on time, so I'll, just, I'll go through all these one by one. All right, so we have a query optimizer written from scratch. I had a, uh, an awesome master's student two years ago build a brand new query optimizer from scratch that follows the Cascades model. We'll, we'll teach you Cascades uh, after spring break. It's, in my opinion, it's the state-of-the-art state of implementation. This is what SQL Server uses, and SQL Server is the best uh, query optimizer that's out there. Um, so we have one already, but we want to expand it and go beyond what we can already do. In particular, we don't have a good cost model. So we don't have a, we don't have a good way to say that this one query plan is better than another. So if you're, you know, if you're scared about right, modifying the query optimizer, you can just focus on collecting stats and, and doing, building a better uh, cost model. You can do query or expression rewriting, like taking predicates, like where a equals one and a equals two, right? Like that it's always false, so you can rewrite that to be false. So you sort of do that before you get to the optimizer, but it uses, uses some of the same techniques that we have in our implementation. And then also too, we we're interested in adding support for auto joins. So now, I'm showing this first because if you choose to do this, in addition to you signing up to work on the query optimizer, you also have to send me your CV because this is what every single database company that I ever talked to, this is what they want to hire. They want to hire good engineers, that's fine. They really want people that do query optimization. So I get emails all the time that look like something like this. Like, hey, anybody, if you know anybody that's a loose query optimizer dude in the Bay Area, we want to hire them, right? All right we don't care about you know, Java and all this other crap, but like, we want query optimization people. There's another dude from another startup. He's a bit, he's a bit more uh, profane about his, uh, his, his, his request, which is fine. So think about this. People that worked in query, query optimizers were really hot in the 90s. And so all the dudes that worked in query optimizers are, are like old now, right? They're not going to go leave and go to startups. But all these new database startups realize they need a query optimizer, so they try to hire somebody. So if you do this, you will get hired. If you do it well, you will get hired. Okay, I guarantee that. All right, the next thing is we want to do add drop indexes. So, so when and, and one of my PG students has been working on adding support for adding back the BW tree into our, our database system so that we can have indexes. So we want to actually now add the ability to, to build an index. So what does that mean? That means doing a scan on a table and populating it. And then for dropping it, dropping it is pretty easy, but that's, that's, not, that's not hard. It's really the, the, the adding it's the hard one. Because you want to be able to do this transactionally without blocking everything. So being able to, so the goal of this project would be add support for create index, uh, first in a blocking way where you, you pause all the, the threads and then you build the index. Then the next approach would be do this in a non-blocking way where you have one thread build the index, then you keep track of what the other threads are doing so that when you, you go to commit, if they modify the table in a way that you missed when you built the index, you can go back and add them in, right? Or you can do the Postgres way. Postgres actually does it in two passes. Um, and there's flags to say whether you want to do concurrent or not. The, another stretch goal would be to actually support building index in parallel, so have multiple threads build the index at the same time. But just having the ability to build the index uh, in, uh, in a non-blocking fashion would be huge. And would touch, again, a lot of different parts of the system. Yes? Uh, does that not depend on the existence of catalogs? His question is, and it gets back to my point before, does this not depend on the existence of the catalog? Yes and no. Drop index, yes, because you, you want to drop it from the, the catalog. But you can build the index without worrying about a catalog because you, you just want to populate it. Right? Yeah. We don't have query plans either yet. We, we don't have an you know, optimizer. So no one's going to be you know, using that index unless, unless it's hard-coded to do that. So you can implement this without catalogs, without a parser, without a query optimizer. All right. So I haven't really talked about the, the, the major goal of the system we're building here at CMU, but the, the, the short end of it is that we're trying to build it to be autonomous, meaning we want to use machine learning on the inside to figure out how to tune itself automatically. Oracle has their own, what they call the self-driving database. We're calling ours a self-driving database. 
Theirs, is, theirs you can buy, ours is better, but it doesn't exist yet, but we'll, we'll get to that later. <laughs> so what we need from, from the old system, that we don't have in the new system, is we need to be able to collect the metrics. So you want to be able to record, here's the low level uh, things that my database system is doing as it executes queries. Locks held, locks, you know, uh, or latch wage time, pages read, pages written, like all those low, low level stats. We want to collect them as we execute transactions and then store them in our own, in our own database. So we had a framework from the, from the old system that was actually a project last year in the class that could do this in an efficient non-blocking manner. We basically want to, want to be able to revive that and integrate that into our system. So it's not just, to be clear, it's not just taking the old code and, and copying it back over. It's going to be a, a, quite a bit of work to actually get this to work correctly. And then the stretch goal would be, if we can actually do this, and we can start reading out data about what happens when we execute transactions, maybe we can, we can build a little mini machine learning model to predict, you know, predict various things in the system. Like how long are we going to have to wait for a lat for each, for, for each transaction or each query. Uh, the next thing is at support for settings. So this sounds like it would be super simple, right? I want to have a, just a, 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 conf a configuration file that I load in and then keep track of like, you know, how many, how many, the size of a buffer, things like that. Um, if you want to do this transactionally uh, and do this in, in, the, in, in the context of a self-driving database system, it actually becomes quite complicated. So essentially for this project, what you want is you build a, a new set settings manager, which is in the catalog, right? In, in Postgres, it's called PG settings. And the thing is just a giant, a giant hash map that says key value. Like here's the, here's the setting and here's the value. So then we would add support. So now when you, you modify this, it's not just flipping the value in, the, in, in, that, in that hash map. You then want to fire off a trigger that then is responsible for going and updating the component of the system that uh, is using that value to then reconfigure it to, 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 to represent the change you made. So for example, if, my, if I have a bunch of garbage collector threads and I've defined in my settings that I, I'm allowed five garbage collector threads, if now I change that to four, that would fire off a trigger that then says go to the garbage collector and says you now have one less thread, reorganize. So it's not just flipping the values in PG settings, it's actually then writing the runtime code that reconfigures the system. Again, the goal for the, the self-driving part is gonna be, we wanna be able to do all this automatically. So we wanna be able to, to have something modify the, the values we have in PG settings that then fire off the triggers to reconfigure the system. And we wanna, we wanna observe what happens when we do this. Uh, we wanna do checkpoints of recovery as we talked about last class. So right now we can do write ahead logs. So if we make changes to uh, a table, we can correctly record the redo entries and sort them out to disk. We cannot do checkpoints, and we cannot fully recover from, from the log. So what that means is that, well, checkpoints is obvious, we don't have them at all. Recover from the log means that we can repopulate the tables, but we can't set up what the catalogs were uh, to, to say, here's what the schema was. So the, for this project, what you would end up doing is, you start off with basically doing checkpoints on just the catalog table, which we're, we're adding in, in, in a week or two. Then you want to implement recovery that allows you to load that checkpoint in, reinstantiate the catalog, and then replay the write ahead log to, to populate the tables again. Then the next step would then be extend your checkpoints, now do a consistent snapshot of the database, store that out into the checkpoint along with the catalogs, and then be able to recover that uh, as, as well. So I think, again, th th this is not going to be easy, but I think a, it'll touch a lot of different parts of the system, and you have a good understanding of what the storage manager is actually doing. All right, uh, I'm going to go through this real quickly, sorry, I'm way over time. So we want to do unified garbage collection. So right now we have a garbage collector for the tables and a garbage collector for the BW tree. We want to have them be a single epoch management system. Next one is that we have one to do interval garbage collection. So the same in the, as you read in the HANA paper, uh, we want to do basically their technique. Right now we only do minimum timestamp, but we want to be able to identify here's a region of, of, of versions that we don't we know we don't need anymore because no transaction can see them. So let me excise them now and let me go ahead and do a garbage collection. So for this, it's not going to be an exact implementation of what they implement in the paper because how they organize transactions is different than how we do things. Right? They have those 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 I think version groups or whatever they're called. Right? They were sort of clustering things. We don't we don't have that. If you loved project one, which is due today, uh, we can go much deeper into this. So if you want to do additional performance analysis and optimizations in to really any part of the system, so basically running call grind, running perf, identifying bottlenecks, <laughs> identifying ways to re-architect the system uh, to make it more efficient, uh, then, then this is something you could pursue. 
I, I know at least one or two other parts of the system where we, we, we could do something, something like this. So the idea could be that you could start off by running perf and call grind on the other workloads we didn't have you examine, identify what the bottlenecks are, and then propose solutions to them. So right now, the one in particular I know about is like we, for inserts, we always go to the same block. Every thread will always try to insert to the same block, but we, we could easily, uh, we could easily uh, parallelize that. All right, the last two I want to quickly talk about are, these are probably going to be the two hardest ones. So I haven't described what, again, what query compilation is. I haven't described what the LLVM is, but the basic idea is that the query plan shows up, and instead of me, and, and it's a tree structure, instead of me traversing the tree and executing the queries and doing, you know, sending tuples up the, or pulling tuples up the query plan tree, I actually then convert the query plan into uh, an intermediate language, that, which I then compile with LLVM, think of LLVM like Clang or GCC. I compile it into machine code, and then I basically have machine code that's hard coded for my query, and I can run that way more efficiently than I can do from interpreting the query plan. Right? The, again, we'll have a whole lecture on this. It's, 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 the performance difference is quite significant. So, the old system had this, but it was a to work with because if your program, if your if your generated code crashes, you don't land with with the stack trace like you do in, G, in, in 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 like an interpretive version. Like if you're in GDB, you don't have a stack trace. You land in x86 assembly. So it's really hard for you to figure out what the hell is going on. So we have a new engine that doesn't have this problem because it actually converts it to a DSL that looks like C. Then we can interpret the, uh, then we compile that into opcodes and we can interpret those opcodes and then you can actually step through and see what's actually going on and match that up with the source code that actually generated those opcodes. And then if that works, then you can fire it off to LLVM and compile that and, and not worry about having to debug x86. So my PG student, uh, Prashant, he has a new engine that does this technique, but right now it's in a separate code base. So for this project, the goal would be to, to bring over his new engine, because we want to do this anyway, bring over his new engine and integrate it into the full system. Because right now what we have is we have the top layer, we're working on networking, we have a query parser, we're working on the binder and optimizer. Then we have an execution engine, and, or so we have a, sorry, a storage manager, but there's nothing, the thing in between is the execution engine, and that's what this would be. So this would be uh, working with the PhD student and helping him bring over the new engine and integrate into the system. So you will touch everything to make this work. And I'm saying, and I'm sort of cautioning saying it's hard because it's, you have to understand LLVM stuff and, and other things, but we can help. Related to this, the last one is also to extend the existing engine to actually support index scans. So right now we can only do sequential scans. Uh, so the, you would have to modify the, the actual LLVM uh, compiler stuff that he has and his, his domain specific language and the opcodes to actually know about indexes and, and then run queries on them. We've tried this two times now uh, in the old system and we failed. Third time's the charm. And it actually, in, in the new engine, it, it should be much easier now. Because we clean up the index API, we, we, it's easier to debug, so this is not impossible, but it, it's, not, it's not trivial. Okay? Any questions? I went through these very quickly. Again, I'll, I'll post all these online. All right. How to start. Form your team, meet your team, figure out what you want to do, uh, sign up, right? mark that you want to work on this project, look over the source code, figure out what you need to implement, and then when you come back from spring break, you'll propose this. I'm around during spring break, if you want to meet with me and discuss things, and if, you, if, there's, if you're interested in like the LLVM stuff, or the recovery stuff, or the optimizer stuff, there's students still around here at CMU that built those things, and we can get you in touch with them to help you, know, help you figure out what, you know, what you should be looking at in the code. Okay? All right, next class. Let's talk about how to actually execute some queries. Okay? All right, guys. Have a good weekend. See you. Get a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I'll guzzle because I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cross, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can chill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause ain't eyes and said the paint eyes red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some same knives and drink it to the suds. Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Pie.